Welcome very much to this short webinar on giving business presentations in a virtual world. And thanks for giving up your time to invest in your skills. In the next 30 or 40 minutes or so, I want to boost your confidence for giving virtual business presentations and share with you a variety of top tips and techniques that you can use immediately. Now we'll pack a lot in, so you may want something handy to capture some notes and take actions that you want to take later. And I'll include a download link to the slide deck and the thank you email that you receive tomorrow. So as we move through the webinar, I'll be looking for your feedback and involvement by asking you questions and ask you to answer those via the chat function. Now, um, when you answer, can you please check that you are sending your response in a way that everyone can see rather than just the panelists so you'll see at the bottom you, it defaults to all panelists so if you haven't already sussed that if you switch it over that would be great so are strong presentation skills critical to career success now surveys regularly show that on average 70% of people rate the ability to give strong presentations as critical to career success. And you could put a really good argument together suggesting that the other 30% just haven't recognized it yet. So here's your first question. Open your chat and switch to ensure that everyone can see your response. How confident are you when you are asked to prepare and give a presentation? and you're rating on a scale of one to 10, 10 being move over Richard, I'll take it from here, and one being I avoid presenting whenever possible. So enter your response in the chat box now. Oh, cool, here they come, nine, five, sevens, fives. Oh, cool, okay, we've got a good range, which is great. So I've worked with thousands of managers and business leaders from many countries, and probably the most common responses to this question I get are scores in the range of five to seven. Standing up to speak in front of others is typically listed in our top four fears. And in a recent Prezi survey, that's the cloud-based presentation software, 20% of people even admit to doing anything, anything to avoid giving a presentation. So this notion of standing up in front of people in giving presentations is pretty intimidating for most of us and in current times we're presenting more via technology which many of us find even more stressful but i've got some good news over the next 30 to 35 minutes or so whatever you scored yourself i want to share with you some top tips and ideas that you can implement straight away and move yourself up that confidence scale I've also included at the end of the session some massive value offers. These are opportunities to boost your skills and confidence even further. And as an added value offer, one of you who gets through to the end of the webinar will today win free access to my online training course, Business Presentation Skills Made Easy. So stick with me. Hopefully there's lots of value and let's see where we end up. Now, in many ways, the best practices for in the room presentations apply online. It's just another medium of delivery. So my next question, what is your top tip, just one, for giving in the room or indeed virtual presentations? So write your top tip, a single word perhaps, in the chat box now. Preparation, yes. Cool. Preparation, I'm seeing a lot. Good lighting, I'm seeing a lot. Smile, plan, rehearse, look at the audience. Yeah, are some really good tips there, people. Really good tips. Well, mine would be the need for focus. It's vital for any presentation, live or virtual, that you are crystal clear on the purpose of your presentation and the two or three key points you need to make to achieve that purpose. And when I ask people the question, what is the purpose of your presentation? It's frightening how few people are able to answer the question. And those who can typically respond with a very woolly response, like to inform people about my project or my product update. 
Uh, here's a typical example. So generally, when you're presenting in business, you are trying to get a positive response to your presentation, get a decision made, additional resource, budget. You're trying to make a sale or you're looking to deliver behavior or process change. So my first tip when you're preparing your presentation, start by writing a purpose statement and make sure it includes something specific as an outcome. So a couple of quick examples. So here I've said, and I've made them current, obviously, to secure £25,000 cash funding to keep my staff employed during the coronavirus crisis. And forgive me, I couldn't resist this one. Um, the average attendee confidence rating to increase by at least one point after successfully implementing my presentation tips and techniques. So getting a strong and clear focus is key to preparing and delivering any presentation, it will start to make decisions about your content easier. What to put in, and probably more importantly, what to leave out. So let's think more specifically about virtual presenting. Question, what platforms are you currently or expecting to present on? Type your answer in the chat box. Zoom Teams, live webinar Teams. Oh, Microsoft Teams seems to be doing well. Eight by eight Zoom. Cool. Okay. Excellent. So we've got a good range of different platforms. Microsoft Teams and Zooms seem to be the, uh, the two biggest. Now, I don't have time in this session to explore the various platforms uh, for this webinar, but I'm, I'm sure you will find plenty of very specific tutorials, tutorials for your preferred platform. Do be aware that they can typically suit different types of presentation. So, you know, whether you're looking to do a live presentation versus something that's pre-recorded, whether you're perhaps looking to do a piece to camera in a more YouTube oriented way, whether you're looking to do a webinar such as this, whether you're chairing a meeting or even presenting as part of a meeting, um, or perhaps you're delivering some training. So let's deal with the elephant in the room the camera. It's a common feature of all the platforms. So question, write one word in the chat box and <laughs> keep it clean. One word that describes your feelings about being on camera. So put that in the chat box now. Nervous, fine, that's good. On show, absolutely. Awkward, okay. Yeah, insecure about lighting. Okay, interesting. So we've got some typically broad responses. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news about the camera. Let's start with the bad news. They say the camera doesn't lie, unless you've got really good video editing software. What the camera sees and hears is what you, the audience, is seeing and hearing. The good news, what the camera sees and hears is what your audience is seeing and hearing, and you can control that. So let me give you some key tips to help you take control. Number one, look at the camera. Get eye contact with your audience through the lens of the camera. It makes a huge difference to the experience of your audience. Now, all too often, people are reading from screens, reading from notes. In meetings, they're looking down at their screens and the images of other participants. And so they're looking away from the lens. Now, that might matter a bit less in normal meetings, but if you're giving a presentation, it matters a lot. So my next question, what percentage of the time do you think we typically hold eye contact with people in everyday conversation? Write your response in the chat box now. 30%, 10%, 20%, 50, oh, we've got a good range here. Anything from 10, 20, 50, 
Yeah, excellent, really good range. So usually we hold eye contact in the range between 30 and 70%, and that is quite a wide range. For virtual presenting, we ideally want to be nearer the top of that range, and even a little higher, maybe as high as 85%. If people are not looking at us, or looking at us very little, we process that as untrustworthy, or even as social dysfunction. It makes us uncomfortable. On the other hand, if people hold eye contact too much, we can feel very uncomfortable and even threatened. So talk through the lens most of the time, but avoid staring into the camera if you can, especially if you're reading from an auto cue or you're reading from notes. When you do look away, make it a definite move not just your eyes you know you see people looking away and reading notes just alongside the camera and it's just their eyes that really move ideally you want at least a 30 degree angle so that you're looking away positively with a positive move you're thinking and then you come back to the camera and you really land your point set your camera at eye level wherever possible it makes it much easier and more natural to look into the lens and more natural for your audience looking back at you. You see a lot of people who have the camera looking up at them because it's on a laptop or something. <laughs> In my view, for most of us, this is not a good look. Okay, so I'll just go back to my slide program, if I may. We will continue on. Think about your background. Now, I've worked from home in my home office for over 20 years and I've accumulated a lot of stuff. Even my bookshelves are overflowing and untidy and bookshelves must be one of the most common backgrounds I see. I guess they think it looks educated. It's a bit like people putting uh, reading as a hobby on their CV. Now, I also see a lot of ceilings and light fittings or a lot of background clutter and it's a distraction and can stop people paying attention to your message. So question, what's your typical background on your virtual presentations? Put that in the chat box now. <laughs> ceiling and light fitting, wall and ceiling. Yeah. Oh, I've lost my chat, hang on a second, sorry. Pictures, white walls, yeah, good. Okay, so some of the software such as Zoom will let you use virtual backgrounds, but you need a plain actual background and ideally a green screen for it to be really effective. So check out your background, tidy it up, remove any clutter, if you do use a virtual background, then make sure it's appropriate for your audience. Make sure you're in a well-lit area. Somebody had just now the uh, notion of lighting on their uh, list. So make sure you're in a well-lit area. Make sure that you're not peeking out from darkness or that you have a bright light that's behind you and it's creating some sort of dazzling halo effect. If you are making a video presentation, then you are much more likely to need proper, I say professional, but proper quality lighting of some description rather than just the light in a room. When you're talking to camera, imagine you're speaking to one person. It will immediately feel more personal to your audience and it will help you relax. Some professionals I know have a picture of a friend or a partner behind the camera and they present to them. I even know one TV person who fits a smiley face image literally around the lens of the camera itself. Be human. Recent research suggests we have 21 facial expressions. Make sure when you're presenting and you're concentrating, you don't get stuck using only one because typically in business presentations that's a neutral or worse still a serious expression looking like a rabbit frozen in headlines i meet a lot of people who believe it's unprofessional to smile in a business presentation 
Now, clearly it needs to be appropriate, but the more you are able to relax, the more smiling will happen naturally. Use your hands naturally. Hand gestures are a vital part of human communication. Different cultures, different individuals use them to varying degrees. Aim to be your usual self. Use open hand gestures wherever you can and avoid the classic direct pointing. And ideally, if you can keep your gestures within a relatively central frame on camera, that's great. Avoid too much hand to mouth or face, even in more normal times. Dress appropriately for your audience. Now, you may well be presenting from home and are happily working away in shorts and a t-shirt, at least, hopefully. Um, fine and comfortable, but not necessarily appropriate for your audience. So if you're pitching to a board of a business for a contract, for example, it makes a lot of sense to wear more business normal wear. If you know it's an informal company and they wear t-shirts in the office, it may be fine. But I suggest the same rule as normal. It's better to match or be higher than your audience than to mismatch below. Eliminate distractions. It isn't only your visual background you need to think about. We screen out a lot of background noise in our day-to-day -day lives, but it's a lot harder to ignore when it's online. I think my music at the start probably demonstrated that. If possible, find a quiet area, aim for a quiet time. And if you can't, then consider using a headset and a mic. It's amazing how often I decide to make a YouTube video, for example, and a neighbor decides that's the perfect moment to mow their lawn or try out their lovely new chainsaw they just bought. So question, what's the biggest noise challenge that you potentially have when you're virtually presenting? Put something in the chat box now. A one-year-old kid, yes. Lots of background noise, children fighting, yeah. Phones, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, we've got a lot of good responses. Some of the stresses of working from home. So it's an obvious point, but reduce interruptions. Classic things like telephones ringing, so turn off your phones. Computer reminders on your calendars and things, mute them if you possibly can. And of course, it's not only noise. It can be people wanting to speak to you or even just bringing you in a cup of coffee. So let others in your space know when you will be presenting or recording. Close doors and put a sign up if necessary, you know, like the old TV studio. Switch off phones, switch off alarms. Also, check out your habits. Watch yourself on camera. And remember, it's good to see and hear what your audience sees and hears. And check out any physical or vocal habits you may have that could become a distraction to your audience and work at breaking them. Make the best use of your voice. Now, I've been to a great many business presentations and most of them tend to be, to be polite, less than exciting. You quickly realise that very few business presenters spend much time thinking about their voice. Yet that voice is the most important tool you have at your disposal as a presenter to get emotional connection with your audience. So even if you've got great visuals, if your content is good, if you just deliver it in a very dry, fairly monotone, boring way, you will quickly lose the ability to connect with your audience. So firstly, use the best mic you can. If you're presenting virtually a lot, it's worth investing in a good quality mic rather than use the one built into the laptop or device that you're using. You'll lose your audience very quickly if your sound quality is poor. It's actually more important than what people are seeing in that virtual world. So pay attention to and vary how fast you're speaking, your volume, how loud, how quietly you're speaking, modulation, the up and down in your voice, the words that you choose to emphasize, how high or how low the pitch that you're speaking. And as a quick tip, 
Higher pitch is generally perceived as a lighter mood, lower, more serious. And finally, pauses. A really important one. Pauses. It's amazing how rarely you hear pauses in standard business presentations. So pay real attention to your voice. Think about how you're going to use it. Record yourself practicing your presentations if you possibly can. And maybe just pick one or two of those elements and think about how you can get variety into your voice. Now, research into the perfect voice has shown that speaking at 164 words per minute is the ideal pace. So, as a bonus for sticking with us this far, in tomorrow's follow-up email, I'll send you a link to download an information sheet about that. It's also a great practice tool. Read it out loud. If it takes you exactly one minute to read it, you're spot on. The biggest threat, I think, to any presenter, virtual or otherwise, is the curse of knowledge. The problem is this. When you are giving a presentation, typically you're presenting on a subject you know very, very well. Maybe a project or a subject you've worked on for months, years, even decades. A subject you are the expert on. That's why you've been asked to present. And you have masses of information. And the risk is that we want to share all that important information. And we assume much of it is necessary and obvious. And as a result, we end up overloading our audience with far too much information and too much detail. In presenting, less is always more. And this is where having a clear purpose and a focus really pays dividends. It will help you eliminate all the unnecessary information that you feel drawn to include. If it's not adding value to get to that point, don't include it. Your aim is to be clear and concise in your message and content. Simplicity is key. So who do you think of as a strong business presenter and why? Keep it something short and concise, but put something down in the chat box now. Branson, yeah, it's Captain John Maxwell. Yeah, well, that's some good examples. Walter, oh, very kind. Winston Churchill, humour and tone. Well, wow, there's some really good examples. Excellent. So one that very often comes up, of course, is Steve Jobs, probably the most common. Um, and Apple generally have been very good at delivering clear and impactful messages. The first iPhone launch presentation was a classic, and it's worth checking it out on YouTube. Keep your slides simple and visual. A great many business presentations still rely quite heavily on using slide decks, whether that's with the most common, which is probably PowerPoint, Keynote for Apple or Prezi if you prefer the cloud. Presenting virtually, that slide deck potentially has even greater significance especially if you're sharing your screen and doing a voiceover commentary. The slide software you use, in my view, doesn't really have a big significance. It's a matter of personal preference, providing you know it's compatible with whatever presentation platform you're using. What is far more significant is how you use your slide deck. Fundamentally, there are three ways that people tend to use slide decks in their presentations. And two of those are really not the most helpful and are probably one of the key drivers of the infamous death by PowerPoint. So the three ways are these. As an auto cue for the presentation notes, effectively. As handout material. And then as a visual aid. So my next question, which of these three ways is your most common approach? And the challenge here is to be honest with yourself. So which of those three is your preferred or likely approach? Put something in the chat box now. Ah, 
I'm impressed. I'm an awful lot of visual aids. I don't believe all of you, I'm afraid, if I'm very honest. Um, yeah, we've got some auto cues. Great. Okay, cool. I would say probably the most common way people use slide decks, certainly in my experience, is as an auto cue. They don't necessarily recognize it though. So they've sat down, they've prepared their presentation in their preferred slide package. And one of the clues is it tends to be heavily populated with bullet points because it really is their presentation notes. They then use it as an auto cue. Now imagine getting home one evening, turning on the TV to watch the news and finding the TV station is simply broadcasting the auto cue. You'd think they'd gone mad. And yet that's effectively what a great many of us do when we're giving business presentations. We're simply presenting our notes to people, which isn't helpful and certainly not a visual aid. The second way people use their slide decks as handout material and they tend to overpopulate their slides with information because the intention is to give copies of the slides out as handouts later. And that is also not a visual aid. Now there's nothing wrong with using PowerPoint or whatever to create handouts if you want to, but keep them at the back of your slide deck and only present from your proper presentation visuals. Of course, the third way is to have genuinely visually based slides that support and emphasize your key points. So my next question, what would you say is the average number of words the typical business presentation slide contains. So stick down your answer in the chat box now. And 500, wow, that's a high amount. 40, 50, 60, 100, thousands, I think somebody's put two, yeah, okay, lots and lots and lots. Well, in fact, research suggests the average is 40 per slide, and that doesn't sound a lot, and I think it's probably brought down by one or two really good slides, but already it means they're tending not to be visual slides and are likely to be the handout material or more typically presentation notes for auto cue. It means that the slide deck is fundamentally helping the presenter remember what they need to say next. So after the webinar, go through one of your slide decks and do a word count. You might find it to be a sobering experience. So think very carefully about how you are using slides. Aim for largely visual content that supports and enhances what you're actually saying. And a great phrase to bear in mind for any slide design is maximize the impact, minimize the noise. And a couple of general easy to implement key tips to help your slide design. Aim for one key point, one key message per slide, and then find a way of making that data or information visual. Now, a great example I saw recently, and forgive me, I know this image is slightly blurred because I've lifted it from a video, but I recently saw a great video of a doctor talking about obesity data in America. Now, he knew all the facts. He was talking to a room full of fellow doctors. They knew all the facts. He could have simply put up a table of data or cut and pasted a spreadsheet. That's what most business presenters would do. What he actually did was put up a map of the United States and slowly filled the states by color, graded by rising levels of obesity. At the same time, he was using phrases like, it's spreading across the country, and we're physically watching it spread on his visuals, which was very powerful and a very memorable way of visualizing the data, of bringing the numbers to life. So for slides, less is more, maximize impact, minimize noise. One key point per slide and make your data visual. For virtual presentations, it becomes even more important to keep your slide images changing, especially if you cannot be seen and are voicing over your slide deck. Now you can do this by building the key elements of your slides. In other words, bringing in the next element as you're talking about it, rather than just showing the whole thing at once. If you are going to leave a static image on a screen for too long, as I'm deliberately doing now, your voice and your content will have to be super interesting to hold the attention of your audience. 
One of the downsides to virtually presenting is you can't always see your audience. Never forget how easy it is for them to switch off and be literally doing other things or simply leave and you won't even know. So you need to demand attention. Tell your audience why they must listen to you early on. You have to be upfront and clear on the benefits and the value you're providing, especially if you're making a sales presentation. Project confidence. You don't need gimmicks to appear to be confident. You don't need to put on a cloak and a mask. It's just a nice image. But you do need to be open in your body language, to stand or sit in a confident posture, and don't forget to smile. Our body and our brains are hardwired together, so adopting a strong, confident posture helps you feel more confident. I'm amazed by how many people I see giving virtual presentations from their couch or even lying on their bed. You need to be relaxed, yes, but to an appropriate degree. But if you look too relaxed, be aware, of course, it may be interpreted as you don't care or worse still that you're lazy. Be authentic. You still need to be you. You don't need to be acting a part or putting on a special voice. In the room presentations are really a performance and there are techniques you need to use to be able to engage with a large audience. Virtual presentations feel like a personal presentation for everyone and you will get much more credibility for being the real you or at least the best bits of the real you. Have a helper. Thank you, Walter. One of the biggest challenges presenting online can be trying to manage the software, switching between shared files, managing chat, questions. It can be a real multitasking bonanza. So if at all possible, and certainly for key presentations, have a friend or a colleague who can help manage the extra elements, leaving you free to focus on giving your best presentation. And it can make a whole thing a smoother experience and a lot less stressful. And don't forget to breathe. Nerves are generally fed by adrenaline. Adrenaline floods our system, tenses our muscles, we breathe more shallowly, which in turn makes us more nervous. It creates more adrenaline and the whole thing quickly starts to feed on itself. So before you begin a presentation, take three deep breaths. Fill your whole lungs, hold for a few seconds, and then slowly exhale and repeat. This is the best way of managing nerves. Once you've started, remember to consciously take deeper breaths when you can. It really can make a big difference. You don't have to be totally polished. I've probably demonstrated that well. This goes back to being human and authentic. If you stumble over a word, if you accidentally show the wrong slide at the wrong time, your audience will forgive you. The odd mistake can be endearing and it can actually help you build an engaging relationship with an audience. Too many mistakes and you risk making your audience uncomfortable. So prepare well, practice, and then relax and go for it. Well, that still has to wrap up what I was planning to get through. Uh, just as a reminder before we move on to Q&A, if you've made it to the end of the session, then uh, here are some offers to help you continue to build your skills. Um, this is uh, the only one of my slides that got close to 40 words, by the way. The average is probably nearer 10 or 12. So, I'm giving you the chance to get 80% off my business presentation skills made easy course. It's a two and a half hour, a two and a half to three hour video based course. Um, and I'm offering it at what I believe to be the bargain price of 10 pounds, including VAT. It's currently got about 5,000 people who've successfully taken the course. So it's got some good social credibility. If you prefer, I've got a six course bundle available covering a range of management skills from recruitment, interviewing to giving performance feedback. And there's also an 80% off that bundle offer and that's got over 22,000 users from 145 countries so again um, good social proof just visit the link use the appropriate code to get the offer 
Online learning is a rapidly growing area, even prior to the current COVID crisis. It gives you know, easy access, it's available 24 seven, you don't have to travel, you can learn when and where you like on a range of devices. It's cost effective, even before I've given you what I think is a bonkers offer. Um, so it's good. So I think that about wraps up from me. What I'm really looking forward to is having lots of time, which I hope we have, to answer any questions that you may have. So I'm hoping Walter will also be in a position to help me with the question side of things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yep. <clears throat> so who, question. What's the question, first, first question? Uh, so we have a question in here. <clears throat> Richard, you said how important the voice is. Do you have any tips on practicing getting more variety into my voice? Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, there's an exercise that I use in real world workshops, if we ever get back to that place, um, which can be quite a lot of fun, but is also quite a challenge. Um, you just need a, a sentence or two, a paragraph of information from anywhere at all. You can get it off a cereal box. It really doesn't matter. And what you also need is a list of different emotions, you know, maybe 10, 12, happy, sad, frustrated, whatever. And then your goal is to read the text, but convey the emotion. And if you really want to, to challenge yourself, um, get somebody to listen to you. Don't let them see you so you give away nothing visually with body language. Get them to read or you read your piece of text and ask them what emotion that you are conveying. And that can be quite frightening sometimes because you think you've given a motivated motivation type feel and they'll say depressed or but it's a very good way of recognizing how important the voice is at making those emotional connections so any random phrases will do it doesn't really matter and then just randomly select some emotions but it can be quite a good fun exercise so thanks richard um <clears throat> another question in uh, best speed of speech what's the best speed of speech would you say well as i alluded to before research which was conducted um i think it was sheffield university in bt in the uk about for they were looking at things like uh talking clocks and online type stuff and so they reckoned 164 words a minute uh, which is probably slightly faster than we speak in everyday conversation and so that document that i've said um you will get a link to on tomorrow's follow-up email mm -hmm. is just a little bit of information about that but it's actually 164 words long so you can use it, so read it out loud and time yourself, and it, you can use it as a gauge to whether you're hitting the 164 or not. Okay, next question. Uh, can you recommend a lamp or brand for screen lighting? Uh, I certainly can't recommend a brand, but it, it, it depends what you're using it for, really. Um, so I've got a range of different lights depending on circumstances so i'm using rightly or wrongly i'm using no light now um it's just natural light because my desk faces a window but i noticed a comment from sally which is spot on um because i'm wearing glasses i'm getting obviously reflection off the window and i, I was aware of it and i've tried an awful lot of things to get rid of that before today's session um the problem I had is if I took my glasses off, I couldn't read anything. So it was a, I had to go with the best, best option really, but I am aware of that. Um, so natural light is good if you can do it and it works for you. Then it's a question of, you know, if you're using, so I do a lot of videoing for um, online courses, YouTube and stuff like that. And then I bought a pack of cheap, what they call soft bot lights. So um, they don't cost a great deal. There's a lot of them on things like eBay but they are just uh, sodium type lights, but big bulbs that have a, um, a, a screen that you put in front of them so it softens onto your face. Mm -hmm. But then if I'm green screening, which although I am now, it's doing it with natural light, normally using a, a video recording, I've actually bizarrely bought two um, LED strip lights, stuck a plug on them, and I hang two of those either side of the green screen on mic stands, and they work brilliantly. So I don't think, you know, there, I mean, there are now LED lights and desk lights and small lights. So if you're a YouTuber or you're presenting like I am from a desk now, you can get just small desk lights that are either LED or whatever. Typically for videoing, you want 
two. So there's normally one that focuses on you and lights your face. And then another one that somehow comes in from the side just to make sure that there's some shadow because if we're lit evenly all over the place, it can look a bit odd really. So no brand particularly, but different sorts of lighting for different sorts of situations really. Okay, thanks Richard. Another question here. Um, what about planning a presentation? How do I approach that? Um, okay, so for me, it always starts with that purpose statement because you want specific end in mind because if you haven't got a specific end, it, it's very difficult to decide what to put in. Then for me, I think about, I don't, so many people start building their presentations in their slide deck if they're using slides, which is what leads them to become presentation notes or handouts. Um, so personally, I would then use post-its or whatever, and I would just think about all the key points that I could include. I'll have done that for this presentation, for example. Um, and then I choose those most important points allied to the purpose, which is the ones that give me the best shot of achieving my purpose then it's a question of turning those into either a story or so that they flow really. Um, so personally, that's how I would tend to go about preparing a presentation, nail a purpose statement, identify the possible areas, then think about a cohesive um, flow, ideally in the form of a story if you can. Then I start thinking about any visuals that I can use to support the message and then would build my slide deck from, from there. Thanks, Richard. Um, another one in here. Uh, many technical presentations are informational in nature. How do we minimise details in those while ensuring everything gets covered whilst hooking the audience? Um, so. <laughs> bad news is it's, it's about your visuals, really. Steve Jobs, fame or Jobs, however you say it, famously said, um, it's not about the numbers, it's about what the numbers mean when you're presenting. If it's just about the numbers, send them the spreadsheet, email them the data, either in advance or after your presentation. The role of a presentation is to bring that to life, to get an emotional connection. And the only way you can do that, in my view, is by having either visuals, metaphors, analogies, things that will lodge in people's mind rather than just giving them a data set. So you need to find a way of making a tangible connection. So like, for example, when I talk about auto cue. I don't just say, oh, you're using it as your presentation notes. I deliberately use the phrase auto cue and deliberately say, you know, imagine the TV station suddenly broadcast the auto cue. You'd think they're nuts. And people can, under, you know, they can relate to that in a real situation. I know that's not particularly database, but it's the same principle is you need to find a way of making the data real. There used to be lots of TV programs about managing money um, some years ago you know, people who got into trouble. And they would often do things like, you know, they'd go in a room and there'd be 5,000 Costa coffee cups because they were trying to demonstrate how much they were spending on coffee in a year or whatever. And just saying, oh, you're spending three grand a year on coffee doesn't mean a lot. But when you see a, a mountain of cups that it represents, suddenly there's an emotional connection. Thanks, Richard. And here's one uh, you'll be able to demonstrate, perhaps. What do you use to create a green screen? <laughs> now, funnily enough, I use a screen that's green. Um, so I'll demonstrate, if you like, that the reason I use this green screen, <laughs> having worked for 20 years in my office, is it, it is not pretty. So if you see anything you shouldn't, I apologise. So behind me here, which side shall I go? Uh, this is probably the better side. Hanging in my office is literally, it's, you probably can't see it on camera, it is a piece of cloth I bought it I have a lot of it because I do quite a lot of the filming um, so I literally put a couple of hooks in my ceiling in my office about uh, three feet behind where I'm sitting uh, and I put two hooks in the ceiling I've hung a dowel pole and then I'm literally clipping that screen to hang behind me uh, and then with zoom and other software you can then project a different image behind you so that they don't have to look at your mess my wife gets annoyed because now my office has a green screen in it. Our spare bedroom, which I use mostly set up as a film studio if we have nobody staying, has a green screen hanging on a wall. But again, it's just a piece of cloth hanging. The lighting with green screen is what's key. Um, and that's where I got those LED lights because it ha the colour has to be even. So when Zoom is a good example, when people are using Zoom in meetings and things, 
if they haven't got a really plain even background behind them and they switch to a virtual background you know they disappear into bits of grass or whatever image they're using it keeps breaking up so for green screening what you need is a good even color and a good even light and ideally you want a bit of a gap between you the presenter and the green screen um, particularly if like me you're a gray-haired individual because if I when I'm filming stand too close to the green screen I'll end up with green glow all around me the zoom software I have to say I, I, it's the one I use the most for this sort of thing um, is very very good at doing this sort of taking away the background so it's quite it's got some powerful green screen elements to it Okay, thank you, Richard. Another one here. Um, landscape is preferred, uh, but on my iPad, my camera is over on the side of the screen and not the top. Does a Bluetooth camera exist that can be clipped to the top of the iPad instead? Ooh, ah, that's a challenging one. <laughs> I don't know is the honest answer um, because I'm not an Apple person, really. Um, because most of the iPad, because the, the obvious answer would have been to use a USB type. You know, I'm using a USB webcam to record this, for example, um, or to not record this, but, you know, to, to do this. Um, but I know a lot of iPads don't have a USB port. So it, it must exist, a Bluetooth camera of some sort, but I'm afraid I don't know any detail about that because I don't use one. But I'd be amazed if it doesn't exist. But Apple, one of the challenges I have with Apple is obviously they make connecting anything to it that isn't Apple slightly harder than it should be, I would argue. A tip in the chat box from Hans uh, uh, for tip for green screen without the hassle. And then there's a link there to uh, a, a website. Uh, another question for you, uh, Richard. How many slides to avoid overkill per 30 minute session? Ah, well, now this is a real challenging one. Okay, it depends what you're trying to do. So I had from memory something like 45 slides. I am going to uh, um, include a PDF of the slide deck in tomorrow's email or a link to it. Um, so anybody who wants to download them. Although if they're good visual slides, really when you look at them in a way, they should be a memory jogger. But if you look at them in six months time, you might start to wonder what some of them mean. Um, so I got about 45 slides and I probably presented for just over 30 minutes and that's a lot. But in fact, I was using a very simple technique. So I wasn't building within a slide. I would just switch to another slide. It just made it safer and easier to do. Steve Kawasaki, who was one of the founders or early VPs of Apple and went on to become a, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He has a rule which I really like, but it's brutal. And he calls it his 10, 20, 30 rule. So he says, on average, no more than 10 slides, no longer than 20 minutes. And here's the killer, nothing smaller than 30 point font size. Um, so 10 slides he reckons. So he's obviously on a slide of one slide for every two minutes. And his view is, you know, he's, he's having people pitch for multi-million pound investment or dollar investment. So, you know, it's serious stuff. And he says, if you can't convince me to invest in 10 slides and 20 minutes, you do not know your business. And it goes back to that curse of knowledge. What most of us do is put far too much information in. You know, he's not going to just invest in a business on 20 minutes. He's, he's just got to be hooked enough to want to do his due diligence. Um, so I, I don't think there's a magic number. Um, it's much more about how you're making your audience feel, really. And if each slide is a, you know, is a, war and peace on its own, or people are having to read loads, you've got far too much. Thanks Richard. Uh, technical question here. What USB camera and microphone would you suggest? Ah, okay. So the, um, the webcam that I'm using is a, it's, I've had it a few years now. So mine is a Logitech C920. I think it's now a C930. Um, and at the time it was, it's an HD webcam. It's highly recommended by YouTubers and all those sort of people. And I, it's just easy to use and I've used it all the time. I've got it slightly further away than I normally would have because of, um, I actually was using an auto cue, for, which I wouldn't normally do, but there were reasons why I did on this occasion. And so to set it up for that, 
I ended up having the camera further away, which means I've had to zoom it slightly. And so I suspect if I'm not, if I move too much, it will start to autofocus. Um, microphone, now I see the microphone in that camera is okay for meetings and things like that. Um, but for this, I wanted a better quality sound. So I'm using, again, it's a classic uh, online mic. It's called a Blue Yeti, that some of you may have come across. Um, I would try and put it in front of the camera, but you'll get an awful lot of noise on the sound. But it's quite a big, heavy um, microphone, but I've literally just got, got it sitting off to one side uh, on a relatively low setting. So it's just a free, and again, it's a USB mic. Uh, but there are lots and lots of, of them available. It, it's like anything, sadly, the more you pay, the better quality you tend to get. But they're not, they're not expensive. The, the Blue Yeti was something like $90, something like that. Um, the Logitech is probably a similar sort of price point. A couple more, uh, Richard. Um, I also deliver CPD presentations, and these are strict content. How do I engage the audience more? Tone, expression, pace? uh yeah and well it depends how strict the content is really i mean there's nothing worse i think than this tells you something about me um you know having a very rigid set of slides or data or information that you have to do so hopefully built within the cpd stuff is enough space for you to expand on points to me it's then down to how you bring it to life and that's through stories examples it's your voice um, and it's pace and it, it, it's those elements really so you know rather than just delivering dry data you you then are able to offer up a well actually you know in my experience this happened or oh have you heard about this business that did this now anytime you use those sorts of techniques stories analogies metaphors clearly they have to be on point so they still have to tie back to your purpose they're not there as fluff. They are there to add value and make emotional connections to people. And in exactly the same way, as I've said, with slides and with presentation content, less is more. So with stories, if you're not careful, people go off. Uh, and I know I can be very guilty of it if I don't really work on it. So less is still more. So you just need short, succinct things that bring it to life. And then the voice, you know, changing your voice, changing your pace can make a big difference. Thank you. And the final question here, Richard, um, do you know a good voice technique for a stronger voice, please? Uh, the, the biggest one is breathing. Um, if, you, anyone is, if you're a singer, you'll know that, you know, our lungs are fundamentally pear shaped. And what most of us do a lot of the time is we breathe too shallowly. Uh, as a result, we only have, you know, oxygen in the, the top half of our lung. And then we are, we are controlling it from up here somewhere. So in singing, and speaking is just singing without notes, <laughs> I would argue. Um, with singing, you, you should be bringing your diaphragm into play, as I say. So in other words, you fill all of your lungs, you take a deep breath, you have air at the bottom of your lungs. The bad news is to do that, really you need to push your tummy out. Um, depending on how fit and lean you are, certainly as you get older in years, most of us have a tendency to try and pull the tummy in a little bit. Um, and that actually makes the restricts your breathing. Um, and so what happens is everything tightens up. So it's about relaxing, taking big deep breaths, breathing fully. And then it's, it's simply, it becomes practice because it's in a muscle. One of the things that I find quite interesting, very often on training, I will if you've got somebody who's very quiet, you ask them on a scale of one to 10 how loud they are, and they will say, oh, seven. And then you ask the group and they will say, oh, two or three. So very often what people are hearing in their head is not what their audience is hearing. Now, the good news is 99 times out of 100, what you hear in your head is infinitely worse than what the audience is hearing. But on volume, sometimes people are worried they're speaking too loud. Um, and in fact, they're not. And what I often say is, look, you know, if you've got a small child or a, a grandchild and you looked out of a bedroom window and saw it about to get in a car with somebody you didn't know, you know, you wouldn't open the window and go, don't do it. You know, they'd hear you in the town next door, probably. So we've all got the capability. It's the sort of mental stuff that stops us, in my view.
So breathing would be the strongest thing. And then it's, it's just practicing and, and again, recording, listening so that you get used to the different volumes. Thank you, Richard. That's really helpful. It's really good. Thank you. Um, and we've got a winner if you wanted to. Oh, hear that. brilliant. Thank you. Um, and it's Glenn Gully. Okay, cool. So Glenn, uh, I will get your details and we'll send you a link so that you can get into my presentation training. So thank you very much for that. Um, I guess that wraps it up from us. So thank you very, very much indeed for your time and attention. I do apologize about the glasses thing. Um, that's something I'm going to have to find I need to solve because unless I completely re-engineer my office, um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge for me. Um, but I, I could go for this, but then I can't see anything. Um, next week, Walter is leading the session because this is a weekly session at the moment. So we are leading a session on using emotional intelligence to strengthen relationships. So very much hope you'll be able to join us again 11 a.m. next Thursday. But thank you very much. Have a great week. Put some stuff into practice and stay safe.